Great. So, uh, <clears throat> talk about a question that we've been interested in for many years, and I, this will be a little bit of the same setup as Dina's lecture. I will walk you back from where we started until where, where we are today. Uh, so these are just my disclosures and uh, I'll start to talk about what we have done in terms of uh, allogeneic and cell based immunotherapies and end uh, with uh, some more recent data uh, on autologous um, NK cells. So um, for us it all started uh, around 2005-2006 when uh, Kalle Manberg joined our lab as a postdoc and uh, we did a number of um, uh, studies on uh, ex vivo interactions between uh, NK cells and freshly explanted human tumors and we started to speculate uh, as to whether NK cells could be used in settings of immunotherapy of human cancer. And I should say very much in parallel, Evren together with uh, Sirak Dilber and others were sort of um, <clears throat> on the same type of thoughts, but in a different uh, setting. And uh, what we, we started to do at that time were sort of uh, just starting to invent or, or make an inventory of all the questions that were around uh, uh, us uh, with respect to possibilities of carrying out NK cell based immunotherapies. Uh, we were thinking a lot at the time, sort of what type of patient groups should one select? Should one uh, select patients with solid cancers like Estina had selected uh, with her um, <clears throat> T cells or should we go for hematological malignancies? And also within uh, these uh, groups, for example, within the group of hematological malignancies, would you go for lymphoid or myeloid malignancies? Evren went for lymphoid, and as I will tell you, we went for myeloid. Uh, we also speculated quite a lot about the conditions and settings um, um, in which you could use um, NK cells. And at the time, we were also um, very much into discussions as to whether one should pre-test uh, patient cells ex vivo prior to infusion of NK cells. That is something that never really materialized, but it was sort of uh, stimulated by our uh, uh, other experiments that had been going on in our lab. Um, another matter that uh, was sort of uh, uh, important for us was the source and, um, of NK cells and donors to be selected. So already at that time, uh, we realized that NK cells could be harvested maybe preferentially from peripheral blood, but also from cord blood, possibly at the time also from bone marrow. And uh, the IPS technology had just sort of came about and it was realized one should be able in the future at that time, um, be able to make NK cells from IPS cells. And as you know, now today it is possible. And there were also NK cell lines, and we were thinking along all these lines, sort of what one should go for. And then, of course, we were also thinking as to if we would go for peripheral blood derived NK cells, would you go autologous or allogeneic? For many of the other options, allogeneic would sort of be the default. Uh, and then we were sort of thinking uh, uh, if we went for allogeneic donors, would it be so that certain donors would be more suitable than others? And there were some indications that that could be the case. So there were many questions. We also uh, had very little knowledge at the time on how to isolate and prepare NK cells from selected donors. Um, <clears throat> should you, for example, use them directly as a bulk population? Should you deplete them from other cellular population that could contaminate them or do other harmful things? Furthermore, should you activate them ex vivo? Should you expand them ex vivo? Uh, and furthermore, uh, choice of media, cytokines, molecules, possible feeders to support survival, activation and proliferation. All these were questions that were largely unknown at the time and where we started to think. And also with respect to culture conditions, uh, flasks, bags, bioreactors or others, uh, we really did not know what to do. Um, 
other questions at the time were sort of relating to uh, identification of an optimal NK cell dose, if such would exist, and what would the quality control and release criteria be. For example, we wondered sort of if there would be an upper limit with respect to numbers of NK cells to administer to a human being. Uh, furthermore, what would the requirements from regulatory authorities be for the characterization of the final product to ensure safety and efficacy? This was sort of, uh, you shall remember, sort of prior to um, <clears throat> cellular products being ATMPs or at the time when they were sort of transitioning to come, become ATMP. Um, we also, in context of uh, the possible usage of allergen egg cells, um, contemplated quite a lot about uh, conditioning of patients. Um, uh, in T cell uh, settings, uh, protocols had been developed for a high intensity myoablative conditioning strategies to allow then for, and also in other NK settings, I shall say, to allow for maximum expansion of NK cells in patients. That would of course be desired. It would also be desired because it would uh, prevent reaction of donor NK cells. It would likely <clears throat> eradicate regulatory T cells that could interfere with donor NK cells, which is an issue. And it could reduce competition for NK cell growth factors such as IL-15, for example. But uh, on the other hand, it could have side effects and cause clinical challenges and therefore we sort of contemplated whether one could maybe possibly with uh, achieving the same um, uh, effects by, uh, by employing a reduced intensity conditioning to avoid some of the side effects. Um, and we did not really uh, know at the time, but that was actually what we opted for eventually. Um, Another question at the time was sort of as to whether you should administer single or multiple doses. Uh, what, uh, should you add supportive treatment? Should you add uh, IL-2, for example, to, to the patients? At the time, we were a bit scared of IL-2 because it stimulated Treg cells that suppressed NK cells. So those were questions that were around. So um, with all this, um, putting everything together, we eventually decided uh, to go for patients with hematological malignancies, in particular patients with uh, um, uh, myeloid malignancies. And uh, we zoomed in on three different patient groups, patients with high-risk myelodysplastic syndrome, MDS, patients with secondary AML, and patients with de novo AML. And, uh, and um, <clears throat> we had to focus on patients that um, were not, uh, or we focused, uh, I shall say, on patients not being eligible for hematopoietic stem cell transplantation because of disease burden. So these were quite uh, sick patients. Um, um, <clears throat> and some of the other inclusion criteria are listed down here. Um, we opted in this uh, trial for uh, eventually for a peripheral blood derived NK cells um, obtained from selected well characterized haploidentical donors and there is a specific rationale um, for that in that some of these donors NK cells may mediate missing cell free activity uh, that is express inhibitory cures that um, do not block NK cells because they don't have a matching uh, ligand on the tumor target cells. Um, we uh, opted for deriving cells via a leukapheresis process and um, then uh, um, opted towards uh, depleting cells from um, uh, the, the, or the cellular product from T and B cells using Clinimax. Uh, we decided at the time not to expand the cells, but rather just to activate them overnight with uh, IL-2, and we did that in flasks. And uh, we did set up some uh, release criteria as depicted here. So uh, when it came then to conditioning, we went uh, eventually, as I indicated, for a reduced non-myeloablative conditioning with intermediate doses of Cyflu. 
Um, and instead of total body irradiation, we um, uh, opted for titrated doses of total lymphoid uh, irradiation. And we decided eventually to make uh, one infusion uh, of uh, these overnight activated haploidentical NK cells to the patients. And at the time, we decided not to give any I2 to the patients because of the Treg um, story, as I and depicted to you. Primary endpoints were defined in this clinical study, uh, safety, and we also zoomed in on the possibility of the NK cells to uh, expand uh, 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 despite a limited uh, conditioning. And secondary endpoints uh, focused on uh, um, uh, effects on tumors in terms of ability to uh, get induction of complete remission in patients. Uh, and with all this, we of course uh, had to do, uh, and we are really, that's really Kalle and uh, Andreas Björklund beyond all others, um, <clears throat> uh, took all the necessary measurements that we needed to prepare all regulatory documents that uh, were needed or were become to be needed in these times. Parallel at Vicura, we did uh, several rounds of validation studies. And uh, in parallel with that, initiated collaborating clinical interactions, donor patient and uh, sample flow processes. And this is the first uh, clinical <coughs> trial um, with its Eura CT number. So, uh, Sorry, so just as uh, Stina indicated, this is a complicated um, endeavor with many, many different interactions uh, seen here is the patient flow. Here are all the collaborative um, clinics and units and above here the flow of, um, of uh, the cells. Uh, <clears throat> So uh, all in all, we were ready uh, eight years ago, 2012, and um, we completed this clinical trial in 2016, uh, which was then followed by an extensive uh, set of exploratory studies on clinical material from patients. So um, uh, <clears throat> in, uh, let me see, uh, so in total, uh, uh, in this clinical study, we managed to enroll 16 patients, five with high-risk MDS, eight with uh, MDS AML, um, and three with, with uh, de novo AML. And all of them were then refractory to first-line chemotherapy and, and ineligible for hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. All of them had been through a number of prior therapies uh, some had undergone an allogeneic hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, but relapsed prior to enrollment. And all patient data is uh, uh, indicated here, and all this is published by now. Uh, what? Uh, uh, no, I cannot move my screen. Huh? Yes, no, okay, yes. Um, yes, uh, so uh, 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 clinical results. So uh, I'll just see if I can move this one. So all NK cell, cell infusions were well tolerated. That was very good. And we didn't see any severe non-infectious or NK cell related toxicity observed during the trial or the follow-up period. Uh, I have some problems moving my slide. I can see Ira is popping down. Yeah, okay, in your body. Yeah, okay, there's something strange happening. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
so um, anyhow, um, um, I, I have, I'm just moving you here. So, um, uh, <clears throat> sorry, so for clinical results, uh, nine out of 16 patients responded to the treatment. That was really very encouraging. Remember that these were patients that were um, uh, refractory to all other previous treatments. Six patients achieved an um, objective response with CR, MCR, or partial remission in combination with improved hematological malignancies. Three patients achieved stable disease with a morphologic leukemia-free state. And most importantly, six of these patients became, uh, as a consequence of treatment, eligible for hematopoietic stem cell transplantation and five of them could proceed to transplantation. One could not due to lack of a suitable donor. And uh, as of uh, the first three years, uh, four patients were free from um, uh, disease. Uh, one of the patients um, then died from a heart attack, likely unrelated to transplant, but um, all the remaining, the remaining three patients uh, are alive at least uh, for the last uh, four up to uh, six years uh, and then it might be even more by now. Um, um, <clears throat> so uh, in all major risk, so, uh, so uh, we started to uh, set up some um, uh, experiment to try to address correlates with respect to responses. Um, we found that in all major responders, donor NK cells were detected at 7 or 14 days post NK cell infusion. That was not the case in the non-responders. Furthermore, in the major responders, residual blast cells actually had upregulated the expression of HLA class 1 and HLA E, um, possibly a consequence of NK cells being eliminate, being able to selectively eliminate MHC class 1 lower tumor cells. I think this has never been observed in a cancer immunotherapy before. Uh, and furthermore, in major responders, patients also displayed specific loss of tumor cell clones, including clones that carried out poor prognosis mutations. I will not go into any detail here. And um, we also observed that major responders displayed a somewhat less pronounced activation of CD8 T cells and lower levels of inflammatory cytokines following NK cell infusion than the minor non responders. So, um, all in all, uh, conclusions from this study is that N these NK cells infusions were very well tolerated with only a few transient adverse events. Uh, the overall clinical response was very good. Uh, there were indirect evidence for an NK cell mediated effect, including uh, the presence of NK cells uh, for seven or 14 days in all major responders and uh, the uh, immunoselection for remaining blast cells expressing higher levels of MHC class one. So uh, the conclusions at the time being was that the present treatment protocol can induce major responses in treatment refractory patients and as such serve as a bridge to hematopoietic stem cell transplantation for patients with these uh, myeloid malignancies. And of course, already at the time when we were performing this study, we saw several possibilities for improvement of the current protocol. And uh, we are um, still finalizing those improvements, but it uh, involves the identification of, um, of uh, subsets of NK cells with a particular high cytotoxic activity. And, uh, with a very high degree of uh, tumor uh, specificity. And our goal is to uh, implement those such cells in um, a new clinical trial, possibly at three different sites um, during next year. So uh, this is sort of to sum up what we can say about allogeneic NK cell based immunotherapies. I think there's a general agreement in the whole field that there is a very clear rationale for using allogeneic NK cells uh, in context of uh, cancer immunotherapy. There have now been clinical responses reported from multiple clinical trials, uh, not only from our study, but also many other studies with good clinical results. 
One advantage with aloe cells is, of course, that you can isolate NK cells from healthy donors where there is no negative effect on the NK cells. You can take them from donors um, uh, <clears throat> that, will, um, uh, that, uh, that have a preferential ability of mediating missing cell free activity towards uh, the cancer cells in the patients. Uh, you could uh, um, expand NK cells and differentiate NK cells so that they acquire uh, desired specificities, for example, adaptive NK cells, which are highly cytotoxic terminally differentiated cells. Of course, uh, when it comes to allergenic cells, um, you can also use them from other organs like uh, placenta, umbilical cord, etc. And um, of course, you can now, and there's a huge industrial interest in this, um, differentiate NK cells from IPS uh, cells and make uh, NK cell products out of these. And all of this, of course, uh, uh, is very attractive, not the least from an industrial standpoint, because it allows the creation of off-the-shelf product, essentially the ability to buy living drugs at the pharmacy to infuse to uh, uh, patients. So, uh, with all this said, is there any position or any place for autologous NK cells? Um, <clears throat> and this is really work um, now by Ebron and by Haret Nahi and others. Um, uh, <clears throat> so, if we start to discuss autologous NK cells, we can start to discuss it in the context of uh, 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 in a historical context. So um, autologous NK cell based immunotherapies were performed initially by the Steve Rosenberg laboratory already in mid 90s with, with uh, very poor results, I shall say. And um, it was followed up by a few scattered reports on allergenic cells in patients with often um, a large bulky solid tumors with again very little results or very few results um, of clinical significance. So all this sort of led to um, more or less the fact that uh, autologous NK cells were abundant. They were considered not to be um, useful. But rethinking a little bit about autologous NK cells, there could be arguments for expanding NK cells from the patients themselves. Um, Evren and many others have now uh, developed efficient isolation and expansion protocols um, for allergenic NK cells, even from patients with malignant diseases, and this is quite an achievement. Many of the protocols that exist now allow for long-term storage of patients' own expanded NK cells. Of course, being autologous, they allow infusion um, to uh, uh, of NK cells to patients without conditioning. There's no GVH or HVG type of reactions, obviously. Uh, autologous NK cells also allow for optimal licensing uh, conditioning in the host. Um, and uh, they can, of course, still mediate missing cell free activities uh, in settings where you have uh, selective MHC class 1 uh, uh, defects or MHC class 1 low uh, tumors. And what we think is very attractive is that they could be readily used, for example, in MRD or um, in consolidation treatment settings. Um, and furthermore, uh, and I think this is also uh, unique for them, you could really use them uh, uh, um, over and over again. That is, you could set up protocols with multiple consecutive uh, uh, dosings. Uh, which could be very important. And of course, products like this could be combined with uh, other drugs such as monoclonal antibodies and gauges or other types of imits, which is uh, attractive. So uh, with this, uh, we, with a company initially named uh, Cell Protect and now is made, uh, now is called uh, uh, XNK Therapeutics. Um, initiated some five years ago an investigator-driven first in human clinical study using ex vivo activated and expanded autologous NK cells 
two patients with um, multiple myeloma that had undergone an autologous hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. So this is um, essentially the, the setting depicted uh, down here. Uh, primary objective of this study was to study safety and tolerability of, um, of uh, the autologous cells and secondary objectives were clinical effects <clears throat> in the patients. So um, this is the protocol, I will not go through it uh, in, in detail uh, other than to say that um, each patient following an autologous hematopathic stem cell transplantation got infusions with three consecutive doses of cells, five times 10 to the six cells, five times 10 to the seven cells, and up to one time 10 to the eight cells with weekly intervals as indicated here. They were evaluated um, uh, <clears throat> uh, four weeks after last infusion, and again, then six months after last infusion, and they have been followed uh, onwards afterwards. As I said, primary endpoint was safety and tolerability. Secondary endpoint was effect on serum Ig levels, M components. Um, uh, uh, and uh, that's of course, we shall point out that what's attractive in myeloma is that you have a biomarker, a very good biomarker in the M component. So you can actually follow the fate uh, of that biomarker as you give your treatments. So, um, um, just to get an understanding of, of what we are doing, I, I made some calculations. Uh, so uh, the question is really sort of what does it mean uh, if you infuse 10 times or one times 10 to the six uh, uh, cells per kilo um, <clears throat> to a patient? That means that you will infuse one times 10 to the eight NK cells to five liter bloods, blood. That, and this was our lowest dose, so that means that you will actually enhance numbers of NK cells with 10%. When you give uh, five times 10 to the seven cells per kilo instead, you will infuse um, about five times 10 to the nine NK cells in total to five liters of blood. Um, and if you make your calculations correctly, you will see, see that you now enhance number of NK cells um, <clears throat> from the normal levels five times. And with the highest dose, you enhance number of NK cells up to 10 times. So we essentially enhance numbers of autologous NK cells and the product that we give is a product of highly activated uh, tumor reactive cells. So uh, these are the patients included. These are um, uh, then uh, patients with rather um, 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 poor prognosis or advanced um, uh, disease stages. I will not go through uh, details here. In, uh, and these patients then went through um, uh, an uh, um, autologous um, hematopathic stem cell transplantation and were then, uh, were then uh, given NK cell infusions. So uh, for some of the patients um, that, um, that um, had remain an remaining M component, the M component went down as uh, NK cells were infused and also um, um, further down here for this particular patient. Uh, for all patients, um, except one patient, uh, M component um, uh, uh, stayed low or undetectable uh, at six months. And the same uh, holds true for the two patients um, uh, in which we could measure serum-free light chains. Um, um, we further went on uh, 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 to look at uh, MRD responses uh, following NK cell infusions. And in three out of four uh, patients, uh, uh, we saw a deepening of MRD um, uh, following the last NK cell infusion. Um, these are data on the six patients. This is, of course, a very small um, number, uh, but uh, Median progression-free survival in this slide was 33, uh, 34 months. Um, um, it may have changed, I don't recall exactly. 
Patients, uh, uh, we now have uh, survival data for up to 57 uh, months of all patients. All patients are alive. Um, so uh, with this being done, um, um, we, we set out to uh, conduct some exploratory analysis. And one of the questions we were interested in was whether was uh, as to whether we could actually measure infused NK cells in the patient. The risk is of course that if you give your product IV that everything will get stuck into the lung and not uh, circulate out in the periphery. So we identified in our cellular product that uh, we had a large population of cells with a very particular phenotype, a phenotype that you don't see in peripheral blood. 56 bright, 16 positive, K67 positive, DR positive cells. So um, at the same time as the patient was infused with the NK cell product, we harvested peripheral blood in the other arm. And um, very interestingly, we could then detect this infusion product um, uh, after not very much after the first infusion, but definitely after the second infusion and after the third uh, infusion. Uh, so to me, this is what actually one of the first cases when one demonstrate uh, or where we demonstrate that we can actually detect autologous infused cells in, in the patient by, by uh, staining for this particular phenotype, which is highly prevalent in, in the product. Uh, we also uh, went on to do a detailed assessment of the plasma proteome in conjunction with NK cell product infusion. And we saw quite strikingly, I don't think this has been seen um, before, at least not to the best of my knowledge, that following e each consecutive infusion of um, uh, the NK cell product, we saw an increase in uh, grand sign B. Um, uh, being a surrogate marker for cellular cytotoxicity. And as you see, uh, the higher dose of cell, cell product you infuse into the patient, the higher levels of grand sign B you see uh, in, in serum. Uh, and uh, even more strikingly, possibly uh, in bone marrow, four weeks after the last infusion of NK cells, we still saw elevated levels of grand sign uh, grand sign B, possibly indicating that NK cells had made their way to the bone marrow and there exerted um, uh, cytotoxic reactions towards uh, myeloma cells. Um, <clears throat> in contrast to uh, uh, many T cell therapies, including core, uh, particular CAR T cell therapies where cytokine release syndromes is a problem, you have very little of that problem uh, uh, with many NK cell trials. Uh, uh, we assessed here for IL-6 and so, if anything, very moderate races in IL-6. I think the highest um, um, level of IL-6 uh, that we did measure was 17 picogram per mil. Uh, which is really quite low compared to the 500 or 1,000 that you may see uh, in a CRS uh, syndrome. Uh, we also, of course, assessed in conjunction with a clinical trial for adverse events. Um, it was important to assess uh, for safety. No severe adverse events were observed, but we did uh, observe a striking uh, adverse event and that was in the first, that was seen in the first four patients. And that was, is depicted here. That is the development of uh, shingles, Beltros in Swedish. And uh, it looked like this in the patient. Uh, so uh, to some of the physicians, this looked uh, fairly scary. Um, they wondered what was going on. Uh, myself, I got pretty enthusiastic when seeing this because this was to me sort of one of the biggest indications of a biological effect of the NK cells. And it so happened that we had discovered more than 20 years earlier that NK cells have an ability to target dorsal root ganglia um, and, uh, and uh, may uh, kill them. And we even mapped through which uh, ligand receptor interactions that were 
So even though we don't know, there is a possibility that some NK cells may make them make it upon infusion to the reservoir cells uh, for the varicella zoster virus uh, and, and trigger the neuron uh, to uh, yes, in such a way that you get viral reactivation and shingles. Now, uh, this is not a big clinical problem. It is um, treatable, uh, so patients were uh, uh, were um, <clears throat> uh, treated with valacyclovir and then rapidly within a couple of weeks recovered. And uh, one of the reasons we don't see this any longer uh, because after uh, with the four, first four patients we went to Lekemils Verket and asked whether we could add uh, antiviral prophylaxis before infusion of NK cells and they approved. So the last two patients uh, got antiviral prophylaxis before NK cell infusions, and in those patients, we didn't see any shingles. We had never envisaged that we would need antiviral prophylaxis giving an autologous uh, product. Maybe we should have thought about this, but it did not occur uh, to us. So that was an interesting experience. So, uh, I'll try to summarize up a little bit the autologous uh, NK cell uh, based therapies or allergen or, or allergenic NK based cell therapies. So I, I, I would like to say that there is a strong rationale, obviously, for allergenic NK cell based immunotherapies. 99% of all companies are working in this space. But what I'd like to say here is that there might be a potential unexplored role for autologous NK cell based immunotherapies. We might be the only one who are arguing that, but I'm pretty sure there is. And the rationale, of course, being, as I said, that we now have an efficient and cost effective NK cell activation and expansion protocol. Uh, it allows for efficient expansion of NK cells, even from patients with malignant diseases. It allows the protocol for long-term storage of patients' own activated NK cells. It allows infusion without conditioning. It allows for optimal licensing of the cells. It may still, in some conditions, mediate missing cell-free activity. And I think what is very important is that Protocol like this could be used in MRD conditions, in maintenance settings, consolidation settings, or other forms of conditions where you have a small tumor burden, where you might not uh, consider uh, an allergenic product with, um, uh, with um, the conditioning regimens that the patient has to go through. And furthermore, I mean, an autologous product allows for multiple dosing over time, which is really good. And it, as I said before, can be used in combination with many other drugs. So actually this product we are now taking further to use it in, in combination with tumor specific monoclonal antibodies, uh, uh, where the hope is that, um, that uh, the NK cells may potentiate the effect of the antibodies by contributing towards um, uh, antibody dependent uh, cellular cytotoxicity, which is one of the mechanisms by which many uh, cancer monoclonal antibodies work through. So this sort of leads me to the very end. Uh, this is where we are now. And uh, now we are sort of setting the stage, stage for the next generation. And that is to develop tomorrow's uh, NK cell based uh, uh, immunotherapies. Uh, we think that many of these therapies will be highly optimized, much more optimized than the current products that we've been working with. Uh, we hope that they will be uh, very readily and rapidly accessible. Hopefully, and we're working hard towards making them cost effective. Uh, whenever possible, they should, of course, be precision-based, and they could be it um, by getting corrified or combined with monoclonal antibodies. And uh, we'd like to design them so that they would uh, be able to um, function against a broad range of human cancers. So uh, the way we foresee that uh, this has to be done in the future is really to 
uh, do uh, now work towards development of tomorrow's therapies in close collaboration uh, with industry and that is academia, SME industry and healthcare collaborations. All of these entities do need each other for development of tomorrow's products. That is um, uh, pretty sure. So um, what we have done here at the Karolinska is that we have team, teamed up some of the, uh, some 20, I would say, world leading Swedish research groups within the NK cell space. Um, that have the mission to tightly collaborate with each other as well as with the Swedish and international industry and healthcare to uh, reach uh, defined set out goals over the coming uh, five years. And we do this within the frame of a competence center supported by uh, Vinova. So we operate here from our new um, laboratory facilities at the KI Hooding in the Ana Futura laboratories. Um, we uh, rely on the great assets that um, are available through uh, the Cura, as well as our new pre-GMP laboratory that is set up um, in these buildings here where we can do uh, um, a lot of training and validation uh, studies. Uh, and to the center, we have recruited, I shall say, key uh, scientists, staff, and administrative support. And uh, we really work very closely together with healthcare uh, and uh, close to industrial partners in this environment. So, uh, how will tomorrow's uh, NK cell ATMP uh, immunotherapies look like? Uh, many will likely be of allogeneic origin, many will be highly purified or specific uh, uh, NK cell subpopulations. There will many of them likely be highly activated, many will be likely precision based, many will be um, tumor directed uh, uh, not only via cars but also via uh, uh, molecules that will uh, let them find their way to their respective uh, tumors out in the tissue. Uh, uh, a thing that everyone and many others are working with is making uh, cells universal that is essentially unrejectable by the patient's immune system despite being, being uh, uh, allogeneic. Uh, clearly many will be produced in large volumes for off-the-shelf usage. All of them that are in development and now are developed in close collaboration between academia and industry. It is just so. Uh, and we of course need the industry here not least to produce um, products for commercial um, use and eventually treatment of patients. So uh, in order to sort of achieve uh, our goals of uh, of uh, uh, making tomorrow's uh, NKSL based products. We have identified a number of areas depicted uh, here uh, by Evren um, that um, um, uh, in which we really need more knowledge um, uh, or, or where, where we need uh, help and support to make the best possible cell products. And very much of this we can through, get through collaboration with industry that uh, uh, adds up to the key knowledge that we have at the Karolinska with much uh, specialized expertise. So these are some of the companies that now uh, collaborate together uh, with us and our scientists at the Karolinska University Hospital to generate uh, next generation's um, NK cell based uh, products. And we of course do this uh, um, for uh, the hopeful benefit of uh, patients, including tomorrow's cancer patients. Um, and uh, hopefully we will achieve something that uh, should have a significant effect targeting this group. So uh, all in all, uh, listed here are just some of the involved scientists uh, to the left. Um, many of the scientists involved in our autologous NKSL based program and uh, to the right here many of the scientists um, involved in our allogeneic NKSL 
program and uh, this is some of the support that we are um, uh, operating with. Uh, I should, with respect to the autologous NKSL based program, mention also XNK Therapeutics, uh, uh, <clears throat> which we collaborate with, which is located at uh, Hooding and much of the work that we do now, we do under the umbrella of NextGen NK. So uh, with this, I think I could take questions if there are questions, if there are technical questions with respect to production of cells, etc. Uh, Evren or others might be better at addressing those. Great. Thanks, Hans Gustav. So if anybody has questions, you can write them into the, the Q&A. Um, I have a question you, when you were saying about making them affordable, you sounded a little bit skeptical. Uh, what do you see as the main challenges in making these therapies affordable? Uh, yeah, uh, I think that uh, if we look at the price for generating our um, autologous NK cell based product, it is actually quite significantly lower than many of the, um, the price for generating many of the T cell products. I think in, in some respects, it might be easier to work with NK cells than with uh, T cells, but uh, price is an issue and pricing of final product is an issue, of course. Uh, um, but the fewer reagents and the less complex uh, media compositions, etc., cetera, um, you, um, you need the better it is. Okay. Without losing potency, of course. Yeah. But you get quite decent scalability, I guess. Um, yes, uh, yeah, we do. And uh, with uh, our next generation allo treatments, I mean, we can, from a few specific donors, generate uh, uh, NK cell based products for um, up to 100 or 200 patients. Okay. Hmm. It's of course so also so that the higher specificity you will get on your cell and the high the higher potency you get, uh, the fewer cells you may may need also. Yeah. Um, okay. If there's no other questions, I'll ask one more. Are you freezing everything down in bags? Uh, Shall we let uh, everyone you want to comment on the on the, yes. the freezing procedures? Yes, we are freezing down everything in bags. How many bags in a batch? One bag per dose. Mm -hmm. oh, okay, of course, you're autologous, but for the allogeneic. So we thaw it patient side and also the allo product. Uh, we're thawing it uh, patient side. Okay, but in terms of scalability for the allogeneic product, you must freeze down, you know, a batch, a yeah. number of bags or? Correct. Correct. 20? Well, it depends on the, it depends on the donor. Uh, so it is, um, the cells are uh, frozen. Uh, it depends on the other program, but I think the one Hoge is alluding to, if I'm not mistaken, uh, is uh, per dose, right? So yes, the, yeah. uh, uh, those adjusted. So the final uh, cell number can be split into 10 doses or 200 doses, depending on the final number you have from the manufacturer. Okay. Yeah. It depends on the manufacturing run you have and uh, it depends on the clinical protocol you have at hand. Yeah. But, um, yeah, essentially you can freeze 200. Okay, and then you have like a freezer, something. Yeah, if you have the manpower. Yeah. Okay, well, I think because Evren got some questions um, after his uh, lecture, so let's guess that some of those questions would have doubled up here. Um, so thank you for, for that. Um, so that's us done for the day now. Um, so we're back tomorrow morning at nine with uh, more of the introductory lectures. And then we're back after lunch tomorrow at one with the Sweet Life ATMP wrap up and the Innova Holmes Milieu 
uh, launch two more national um, Bonova projects. So thanks for today and we can leave it there. Thank you so much. All right. Catch you later. Bye-bye.